the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as stewardship season begins, I'm, I'm giving thanks. And I'm thinking about how generous this body has been for over 20 years. And I thought back, when did our culture of generosity begin? Well, immediately I remembered, before our grand opening in November 2001, that's what the Nixons looked like in 2001, right? We gathered a pretty big launch team. There were about 50 people meeting on Saturday afternoons at St. David's Episcopal Church, and we wanted to begin public worship in an elementary school. You see, the elementary school was, uh, the schools were one of the few places in this totally new neighborhood, right, that had any kind of public Uh, gathering space at all and people felt good about the schools we wanted to be in the school on a Sunday morning and we waited and we signed up early we got into the school in Mill Run but the school uh, it turned out wouldn't make any storage space available to us at the school now we needed a lot of stuff and some of you are nodding and you remember all of this right we needed a lot of stuff to do church Right? We needed uh, preschool chairs. We needed sound equipment. We, I mean, there were, there were sound boards and there was all the, you know, instruments. There was a drum. I mean, there was all this stuff, um, you know, liturgical stuff and vestments and you name it. And we needed to put it in a trailer and haul it in every Sunday, take all the stuff off on these rolling cabinets. We still have some of those rolling cabinets. You can see them, Right? And then set it all up, and then when service was over, tear it all down, right, and put it back on the truck and take it off site again. Beloved, people in this church did that every Sunday for 10 years. Think about that. Think about the service, the generosity of time. Uh, But it wasn't just the generosity of time. There's also the generosity of money. We needed to buy this stuff, and we did not have the money. And so I prayed, and we thought about it. And we're like, how are we going to get the money to buy this stuff? It was $40,000. That's about almost 80000 in today's dollars, right, of stuff, equipment we needed to start church. And the Lord gave us this idea. We're a baby church. We're going to have a baby shower. So we printed up these invitations for a baby shower, and uh, we gave them to our people, and we asked them to give them to all their friends and their family. Right, So it wasn't just our people, but it was all kinds of other well-wishers. And hundreds and hundreds of gifts came in. And we were able, we actually raised more than the $40,000 at that time. And uh, that, I think, was this marvelous outpouring of generosity. People saw the need, they saw the value, they caught the vision, and they gave generously. Praise be to God. So all those gifts came in. We, 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 um, we had everything we needed in time for our grand opening on November 11, 2001. It was a huge success. We had 204 people at our grand opening. And we were off and running. And uh, that same culture of generosity of time and of money persists to this day. And I just want to say thank you. May I say thank you? Thank you. Thank you for your generous giving. Thank you for your time. Thank you for giving your money. Thank you for giving your tithe. Thank you for giving beyond your tithe. Thank you for your heart for this mission in Loudoun County. You know, by God's grace, we're firmly in the black this year, positive, both in our giving targets and how we've held down expenses. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're about $40,000 in the black in our giving targets this year. And we were way behind earlier. Praise God. We are not a large church. But, beloved, let me tell you, our church punches above our weight. <laughs> Both in service and in giving. Praise be to God. And thank you so much. Now, I'm preaching a three-part sermon series on generosity and stewardship. From Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. It's all about generosity. You know, we admire generous people, don't we? 
We love it when people are generous. We teach our kids to be generous. We want to be generous, right? We long to be known as generous people, some deep inside, even if we, we try to like not let anybody know, right? <laughs> if, I mean, if you have a choice between being known as stingy or generous, you want to be generous, right? You want to be the one that gives 25% tip, you know, not, not those church people who come and give a 5% tip, you know, after, after they come from church. You know, that's a poor witness. Say, that's right, pastor. <laughs> right, we want to be generous people. Well, the question is, how do we become generous? Well, I've got, you've got a sermon leaflet insert, and I want to encourage you to pull that out right now. <clears throat> and fill in the blank. Generosity springs from a heart of love. Let's say that together. Generosity springs from a heart of love. That's right. It's all about your heart. So 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 contains the longest passage in the New Testament on the subject of giving and generosity. It helps us to understand that giving and generosity are matters of the heart. It's really about our motivation to give. Paul speaks in both his letters to the church in Corinth about a collection that he's taking for famine relief in Judea. He says, 2 Corinthians 8.8, 8, 8, 8, he says, I am not commanding you to do this. This isn't the tithe, this is the offering, right? This is the special offering um, for uh, the saints in Judea who are starving. Several times he repeats this theme. At 8.11, he says, I want to see your eager desire to complete this gift. At 9.7, he says, give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Now, this is really noteworthy, at least to me, right? Can you imagine Paul saying about other areas of ethical concern, let's just say sexual purity, Imagine Paul saying, I don't command you to be sexually faithful to your spouse. Only do this if you really feel like it. <laughs> of course not. That's ridiculous. He would never say that. But why, then, does Paul give freedom in this area? One commentator said, it's because with greed, there is no external behavioral referent that tells us where greed begins and generosity stops. Not like you can say, well, if your house is more than 4,000 square feet, then you're being greedy. Well, if that were it, then I'm in the greedy category, okay? <laughs> I got this huge house like many people do uh, in this neighborhood. But, you know, but the, the thing is, there isn't any line, right? You can look at something completely extravagant and say, that's ridiculous, right? But, but in Loudoun County, where is that line? Right? With a median income of $160,000 per year, what is the line? Where's greed begin? Nobody can say what it is. On the other hand, <clears throat> let me just say, if you're committing adultery, you know it. Right? I'm not talking about in your mind. Right? <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the comparison, right? Sexual purity in marriage. If you're committing adultery, you know it. There's no question in your mind about that. In the story of the widow's might, the widow gave very little, but it was all she had. And Jesus commends her for her generosity. See, beloved, generosity is about our heart motive. It's really about our heart. You might be thinking, well, what about the tithe? Isn't that a line? And external behavioral referent, if you will, where we can tell if we're sinning or not? Well, in the Old Testament, the Levitical tithe was indeed required for God's people. It's part of the law of Moses. And you may have heard that some teachers say that the New Testament never teaches the tithe. I disagree. Go back to Matthew 23, 23, which was read today. Jesus commends the Pharisees for tithing everything, even down to their spices. 
he says, uh, uh, he endorses their behavior in this regard, but he immediately excoriates the Pharisees for their heart attitudes because they thought that tithing, even their spices, was enough. But no, he says, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You've neglected justice and mercy and faithfulness. Jesus said they should have practiced the latter and not neglected the former. In other words, you need to have justice and mercy and faithfulness in mind, but you shouldn't neglect the tithe. This is Jesus teaching on the tithe. Like Paul, Jesus is more concerned with our heart motives for giving than he is with the external amount. Now, in this extended passage about money, it's curious that Paul never uses the word money. He doesn't use the word collection. Now, it's, it's clear from the context it's exactly what he's talking about. But he says in 8.8, he says, I want to test the sincerity of your love. You see, it's about our hearts. In this case, their hearts for the poor in Judea. In our context, generosity is about your heart for the local church to thrive in our mission. It's about your heart to feed the poor at Tree of Life in Leesburg. It's about your heart to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. John Newsom is this Sunday preaching the gospel in a prison in Somerset, Pennsylvania. He's already seen several people come to Christ. Praise God for John Newsom and his heart for the gospel, right? But he's going to Pakistan this late fall. And the government, he's gone for several years now, and the government has told him that they are now permitting him to go preach the gospel in previously closed tribal areas that they've never permitted Christian preachers to go to before. Okay? Now, so John has a heart for the gospel, but he needs your help. He needs your money, and he'll ask several of you. Some of you regularly support him in these, in these matters. But you see, this is a matter of the heart. It's like, what is your heart attitude toward those people who've never heard the gospel? Are we willing to put our money where our mouth is, that is what we pray for? Now Paul opens this passage, chapter 8, verse 1, by speaking about the grace that was given to the Macedonian churches. Now in the middle of a severe trial, he says, in verses 1 and 2, their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Paul says they gave beyond what they were able and urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing in this service to God's people. Now, I want you to understand the context. Corinth is a major city. It's like New York City. It's a port. It's a hub of commerce. It's in Greece, okay? It's wealthy. There's lots of people who make lots of money in trading and in commerce. They're merchants in, in Corinth. Now, Macedonia is to the north, and it's a rural area, and relatively speaking, very, very poor. It's like Washington, D.C., and central West Virginia, okay? Like Jefferson County is rich compared to most of West Virginia, right? That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> and Paul uses Macedonian churches as an example of godly generosity, I think he's trying to stir up holy jealousy uh -huh. in the Corinthian believers who have so much more money, right, that they would see the example of their quite poor Macedonian brothers giving freely and actually begging for the opportunity to give more and more liberally for the relief of the saints in Judea. They gave sacrificially. Verse 5, Paul says they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. Now, the Macedonians weren't asking, how much do I need to give so that I'm not embarrassed by it? Or, how much do I need to give so God isn't mad at me? 
<laughs> right? They had generous hearts, so they gave eagerly, sacrificially, even beyond their ability. Well, how in the world do people give like that, you wonder, right? How do you give beyond your ability? Well, the only way it's possible is if you've first given your heart. You've given your whole heart, you've given your whole mind, you've given your whole life, you've given your whole bank account. You, you understand that everything you have belongs to the Lord. If you want to be a generous person and you know you're not, then I want to encourage you, don't start by looking at your budget. Start by looking at your heart. Do you truly appreciate how much God has done for you? Do you truly appreciate how much God has done for you? Now, the number one indicator of mental health is gratitude. The number one indicator of mental health is gratitude. If you're depressed or if you want to live more generously, here's my advice. Start a gratitude journal. Okay? Just take some time every day and write down something that you're grateful for. I want to encourage you. If you can, sometimes it's not easy, right? You have to think hard about what you're really grateful for. Right? And God will give you gratitude as you think about your blessings uh, from the prior day. Now, <clears throat> if your marriage isn't great right now, I want to encourage you, consider telling each other every day for a week three things that you're grateful for with each other. Even if you're not married, but if you have a roommate, well, ho however it is, just express gratitude verbally to one another. And I, I tell you, after a week, I believe you'll see a change. Just expressing gratitude helps in every way. The more we express it, the more generous we'll be to others, the more forgiving we'll be of ourselves. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two, to become generous, remember that God owns it all and he gave it all to you. Let's say it together. To become generous, remember that God owns it all and gave it all to you. Of course, it's, a, um, it's something of a cliche that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? We say that to each other. You know, especially when you ask, so <laughs> as a pastor, sometimes I ask people for money. And they'll say, oh, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Like, yeah, but it, does he own your cattle? <laughs> well, of course he owns your cattle. He owns your hills. He owns your house and everything else you have. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul says, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you then received it, why then do you boast as if you did not receive it. Don't we Americans like to think of ourselves as self-made? We do, don't we? <laughs> I mean, we love the stories of people who come up from poverty and, you know, become well-known or um, really experts in their field or uh, have done great things, and, 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 and so we should. But we, we, we often think that we did it ourselves. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of showing my age here, but I remember when I was young, there's this, there this actor called John Houseman, right? He's a sort of British guy, and he played in the paper chase, and he, he did these Merrill Lynch commercials. Remember those? <coughs> and, um, and he said, at Merrill Lynch, we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. Remember that? That was really good advertising for Americans, right? Right? <laughs> because actually what they're doing is they're not earning money, they're just having passive income, right? 
But the thought of earning it, we do it ourselves, you know, pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps and all that, right? Now, it is true. In order to succeed at anything, you have to put the work in. Absolutely true. But the deeper theological truth is that everything we have is a gift from God. Your salvation, your money, your family, your brains, your education, even your motivation to persist and succeed. Everything is a gift, and not of works, that no one should boast. So the Bible teaches that we're to be stewards of everything. All of God's gifts. Now, a steward is one who's not an owner of a property or an owner of a business, but rather a manager, someone who oversees a property or a business on behalf of and for the benefit of another. That's a steward. And the Bible teaches that whatever we have, we're only stewards of that. Not only just stewards of the property of our employer, but stewards of the property that is in our name. Not just our property, but our time and our talents and our relationships too, even our very lives. Paul says at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he says, you are not your own you were bought with a price. Once I heard the story <clears throat> of an older woman who had finished shopping and returned to her car. And to her horror, there were four men inside the car. She dropped her shopping bags and picked up the large handgun that she had in her belt, pointed it, screamed at them, I have a gun and I know how to use it. The men did not delay. She said, get out of the car. Immediately they scattered, right? She picked up her bags, put them back in the car, took out her key, and no matter how hard she tried, the key wouldn't work in the ignition. <laughs> Suddenly it dawned on her, oh no. This is not my car. She gets up and she looks around and she finds her car. She puts the key in the car. It starts, gets her bags, put them in the car, drives to the police station to turn herself in. <laughs> gets to the police station and she speaks to the desk sergeant. And she says, oh, I'm so embarrassed. But let me tell you this story. And she tells him the story, and he almost falls off his chair laughing. And, and he says, lady, you see those four guys on the other end of the station? They just came in here saying that a little old lady less than five feet tall pointed an enormous handgun at them and told them to get out of their car. You'll be delighted to know that no charges were pressed. You see, she thought it was her car, but really it belonged to someone else. We think our lives are our own, but really they belong to God. We think our money is our own, but really it belongs to God. The truth is God owns it all. If Jesus Christ is truly the Lord of your life, that means, among other things, that he's your master. And that when he asks you to do something, you do it. And why do we do it? Well, we do it because we love him. And we love him because he first loved us. As a spiritual discipline, I think we need to keep giving ourselves and our stuff back to God. Some of us really need to do this. Now, I want you to know, I'm in full-time ministry, as most of you know, and um, I, I decided long ago that my time is not my own, right? And uh, so, just 
whatever time it is, morning or night, um, I've, gi- I've already given that to the Lord. So if, however he wants to take it. I mean, I think I've been faithful in that. I don't really think of my time as my own. But I want you to know I'm not as good about how I think about my money and my stuff. Typically, when I think about my money and my stuff, I think of it as mine. Right? And it's only when I stop and reflect on it that I realize, well, no. (laughs) It's not really mine. You know, uh, (sighs) and, um, you know, I really like my income. I, I like my house. I like my retirement accounts. But the truth is, all that belongs to God, and I'm just stewarding that for him. I encourage you to join me today in a spiritual transaction. Many of you have done this before, but uh, even if you have, I want to encourage you to do it again. Dedicate or rededicate your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ today. As part of that, give him all your stuff, your income, home, your savings. Give it all to God again. Tell God that he owns it and that you realize you're only a steward of those things. When you do, who knows, he might just ask you to give some of it away. You remember the story of Barnabas in the book of Acts, right? Uh, They were taking up collection for the needy, and he gave a field that he owned. That's uh, one of the ways, I think that's how he got the name Barnabas, actually, son of encouragement. So I want to ask us to pray, and I'd like to ask, this is a serious prayer I'm asking you to do to rededicate your life to the Lord, so I want to ask you to kneel. Would you please kneel, if you're able? So I'm going to lead us in this prayer, and I'm going to say out loud a phrase, and then I want to encourage you to say it out loud after me. Let's pray. Lord, everything I have is yours. Please forgive me for forgetting that all I have, all I've done, is really a gift from you, made possible by your grace. Deliver me from the presumption that I've accomplished things all on my own without your help and resources. Help me to live as a steward, not an owner, a steward of my time, my stuff, and my life. Lord Jesus, I dedicate my life to you. Or I rededicate it today. I need your help to be a generous person. So make me into the man or woman you desire me to be, O oh God. Thank you for your transforming love. Amen.